pray that you would open up our eyes to see the things in your scripture tonight that you want us to see. Help us all grow closer to you. Help us learn about you. And uh, just make this book that we're beginning to study tonight, Revelation, just make it come to life as only you can do by your spirit, for our spirit. So we pray that in Jesus' name. Everyone agree with me, said? Amen. Amen. So tonight we're going to start, we, we looked at Revelation just like a kind of an overview to introduce it. But uh, we didn't record it last week when we did it, so I'm going to try recording it for the rest of the gang to be able to watch this. And we're going to start off with Revelation chapter 1. So first off, grab your Bibles or your devices and turn to Revelation chapter 1, and uh, the last book of your Bible. This is this is the book that, um, well, Gober read the verse last week that it says that if you just read this book, okay, anyone who reads this book, do you remember the verse, verse 3? That you read? We'll be encouraged, right? What, what will happen in verse verse 3 of Revelation? Look at your Bible and, and tell me. I know already, guys. I'm not trying to, like, find out from you. I already know the answer. <laughs> I want you to find out. What does it be say? Blessed. Yeah, blessed is the person who reads this, this book, who hears the words of prophecy, and does one other thing. What What's the other thing that you have to do? You can... Deep the things that are written therein. Yes, and you keep the things. You heed them. In other words, you actually do them. It's You can't just say, well, I, I read the book of Revelation, so therefore God has to bless me. Okay, this book is meant to be read and kept, heeded. You have to heed the warnings in it. In other words, you have to you have to hearken to them. You have to obey them. And if you do, if any anything the Lord tells you to do, if you do what he says, will you be blessed? Yeah. So this book comes with a built-in blessing. Just, I mean, there's the blessing of hearing the words of prophecy in this book, because as we're going to study in the, in the book of Revelation, the, the word revelation, by the way, in Greek is apocalypse, which I find very interesting because we make movies like apocalypse. And what, what's, what's the general theme of a, you know, apop, apocalyptic movie? Death, the end times, the destruction, end of the earth, you know, kind of thing. Well, that's the, that's the um, world's translation of apocalypse, revelation. But the biblical revelation that we're going to say, the apocalypse, is the end of all things, how it's going to wrap up. And, by the way, there is a lot of wars and blowing up stuff, and, you know, there's going to be great judgments that come. But there's also great promises that come. So I like the book of Revelation because it gives the greatest promises for the believers. We have it We have it really good when we read the book of Revelation. Now, if you're not a believer and you're listening to this, you should be freaked out. And there's no problem because, you know, you need to become a believer. So that you don't have to be in the pool of people that are going to go through all the bad stuff. But to sum up what I've, I've shared with you before, what's the whole story of the book of Revelation and it's a, it's a story about how in the end times there'll be a great battle between good and evil. And who wins? We already know. Good, good. The good guys win. So get on the good side. I mean, it's bottom line that the book of Revelation in a nutshell. But tonight we're going to look at... Now, this is written, penned by John the Apostle. The guy that we studied that leaned on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper. He was that close to the Lord. So we're not talking about somebody who didn't have any exposure to Jesus, he was right there with him. He, and when he wrote First John, he said, My hands handled, you know, what my hands have handled, I've touched, I've seen, I've heard. Like, he, he didn't just say, Yeah, I, I heard about him. He's like, No, I was right there with him. I, I saw what he did. And, I, and he proclaims all these things in John's Gospel and in First John, Second John, Third John. And this is the last book that's attributed to John the, the Apostle, the book of Revelation. And it starts off with this. It says that, that this is written for the guys that like a uh, timeline. This is around 96 AD. So John at 90, 
Do you guys remember when Jesus was crucified? About roughly? 33 AD. Correct. So, 33 AD, Christ is crucified. And if this is 96 AD, how many years is it later? Do math, quick. Come on, 96 minus 33. 63. Yeah, 63. So 63 years have passed since Jesus has ascended to the Father. And during those 63 years, we know that John was called by the Lord. He was an apostle to the Gentiles. He had a real ministry. He did minister to the Jews too. But it seems like God used, like Paul said, God used him to be an apostle to the Gentiles while God, uh, and, and God used him effectually, he says. Well, at the same time, God used Peter as an apostle to who? Jews. The Jews. Okay, this is, th this is something that's written, it's just a side note, but in Galatians 2.8, it says that God, Paul was saying, look, I, I've done my, my ministry, but, but it was God working through me. And God did all these wonderful things for me to bring the gospel, the good news, to the Gentiles. Well, at the same time, God used Peter to bring the gospel to the Jews. Okay, so he, he recognized there was a difference. Now, when Paul wrote to the, to the church at Rome, he said that salvation was first to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. It was to the Jews first, okay, and then to the Gentiles. The Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah for the most part. And, and because of that, the Lord said, because of their unbelief, I'm going to take wild olive branches and graft it into the natural olive tree. And then he, Paul gives a really strong rebuke. He says, if you guys think you get to stay on the tree as wild branches and you quit believing, and God didn't spare the natural branches, he snapped them off when they quit believing, what will he do to you if you quit believing? It's like, well, the natural branch belongs there. We don't even belong there. We were grafted in like post facto. So he's, he's basically saying, make sure you stay believing. Keep the faith. Okay? And this book, by the way, is going to help you keep your faith. In fact, this book builds up your faith. Because this book reveals to us. It's a, it's a revealing. Apocalypse is like the pulling back, the unveiling or revealing, the, the bringing to light. Like putting a limelight on something where you show it off of the spotlight and look at this. You know, that's what revelation means. And who's the spotlight going to be on in the book of Revelation? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, that's what this whole book... By the time you, you study through the book of Revelation, your faith in Jesus just grows so much. Because it focuses you on the Lord and what He does for us. So, let's look at verse 1 of, of Revelation 1. And it says, in The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him to show His bondservants, the things which must soon take place, and he sent it and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and, and those who hear the words of prophecy and heed the things which are written therein. For, for the time, he says, is near. Now this is interesting because the whole book of Revelation, you guys, anyone read through the book of Revelation or skimmed it at all? Have you guys heard studies from the book of Revelation, like mm -hmm. how the end times things are going to go down, and it, it really lays out some really specific prophecies. By the way, it's not new news to God, it's just new news to us. He's the, as we're going to see, he's the beginning, the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and end. No trouble when you know the whole story and you're God. It's just from our perspective, we don't know it. And in Ezekiel, God repeats this one line. He says, you know, I'm the first, the last. I will tell you what will happen before it happens. Why does he say in Ezekiel 44? I'll tell you before it happens so that when it happens, you will know something. What is it we know? What? Yeah, you will know that I am the Lord. That's right. You will know. It, like, it helps our faith to know we have a God that actually knows stuff ahead of time. He doesn't... It's not like, oh, oh, surprise, I didn't expect that. You know, he's not caught by surprise by what we do. He's already seen the whole parade march by. We are the ones watching one float at a time, that analogy I used last week. We don't see the whole thing yet. But he's already seen the whole thing from his perspective in the sky. You can see the whole 
timeline parade by, and he's seen it all, the beginning to the end. So he's declaring to us stuff that will happen, so that when it happens, we don't go, oh, wow, that's pretty interesting. We, we go, all right, man, God already knew this, and he told us this, so we could be encouraged when it happened. So we don't get freaked out. We, we're going, cool, stuff is starting to happen. Now, is things happening in today's world that were prophesied in the Bible from long ago? Are we seeing things come to pass? Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And here, when John, what I love is, John's writing this about 63 years after Jesus ascended. And he said, the time is near. At 63 years, this is the, what we call the first century church. The church isn't, by the way, the church as a church, followers of Christ, the way, isn't even 100 years old yet. And, and what was John's attitude? How, how soon do you think he, he thought it was going to be till Jesus got back? That very day. He's like, it could be any minute, man. It could be, it's, uh, the end is near. Now, for our perspective, when you look at things in the Spirit, it changes your, your perspective of time. Because, like Peter wrote, he wrote, to the Lord a day is as what? A thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. So, how long has Jesus technically been gone from his perspective? A couple days. Not, yeah, not even a couple days. A couple days. He's been gone a couple days. Not even two full days has he been gone. So, interesting, because on the third day, and the third day is, the, is, is significant in the Bible, the third day Jesus rose from the dead, right? Mm-hmm. What about the third day? It talks about a, a thousand-year reign of Christ. What if on the third day we begin his thousand-year millennial reign? He left at 33 AD. We're almost to 2033, right? That would be two days beginning of the third day. I'm just throwing that out to you because I think we're getting... Re- if John thought we were near back then, I submit to you, we are really near to the end of, uh, of these things coming to pass. And this makes this book even more exciting because we know his coming is, is coming even closer than when John wrote these words. Now, John says he received all of this stuff from which angel? We did this last week, so I want to see if you remember this. Who, who, which angel? I, I told you. A specific angel. No. It, did, what, it didn't say his name yet. It just says... Oh, Jesus. The angel of Jesus. Jesus has his own angel. I just want to point this out for fun for you. This is like Bible trivia. Later you'll stump your friends like, did you know Jesus has his own personal angel? What, by the way, an angel in Greek means ministering spirit. A spirit made to serve. A minister, by the way, is supposed to be a servant, not a guy that bosses people around. He's there to help serve people. Jesus said, I been, I'm the master. I when, when he took off his robe at the Last Supper and put a towel around his waist and got a basin of water, what did he go do? Yeah, he served. He washed their feet. Come on, is that a really prestigious job? To wash people's feet back then? I mean, think about this. Leather sandals, dirt roads, guys that don't bathe all the time, and you go and wash their feet. That's like a low, low job. And Jesus said, if I'm the master, you call me master, Lord, and I did this to you, what should you guys do for one another? If he would serve us, what should we do to serve to serve others, right? So he was setting an example. I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. So, and Jesus himself has a ministering spirit, an angel, that serves him. In fact, in this, in this book, you're introduced to the idea that it's the angel of Jesus that brings the message to John and says, write down these words. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself because I'll just read you what it says next. When the angel comes, it says, John, he, he writes this, he says in verse 4, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. By the way, is Asia like the land of Israel? Do you guys know your geography? Over? No, it's not. Okay, it's yeah, it's up around the Horn from Israel, and it's it's um, what we call the area of the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. 
for the most part, they're, they're Gentile folks. And so he writes this. This is what the... So first of all, this message is to the seven churches that are in Asia. He says, Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. From the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has released us from our sins by his blood. I love this part. He releases us from our sins. He goes, oh, you're stuck in sin? No trouble. Like, you feel it. You know, some people tell me, gosh, you don't understand. I'm in bondage to this. I just can't quit. I have this bad vice. I, I mean, I've done it since I was really young. And I just can't. It, it's got a grip on me. And I'm like, I know who can release you from that. You know who it is, right? It's Jesus. Jesus can release somebody from any vice, any bonds, any addictions. Jesus can release them just like that and, and, and make them whole. I've seen him take people that are totally stoned out, high as a kite on drugs, and call on the name of the Lord, and the Lord has just instantly sobered them and set them free. It's like not going back. Christ touched me and gave me freedom. He is able to release you from, from your sins by his blood. Now, this is the intro to Jesus. That's a pretty good intro. You, you're talking to seven churches in Asia, and you're like, um, by the way, um, this message to you guys is from, first from God, the guy who, you know, the intro is, it, it, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but you get God, you get His Spirit, and you get His Son. Or, when I was raised Catholic, we always said, Father, Son, and we made the sign of the cross over our chest, from our head, down to our, to, to our belly, over across our heart, from this side to this side, we go, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Like God has all these parts and we would always pray as we do our prayer time the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Well, I kind of grew up with this idea that you know, you got God the Father, you got His Son, and you got His Spirit. I mean, there's no big deal to me. But this, this angel writes that His Spirit is like, He throws in one little leaf hand. What's it say about his spirit sitting before the throne? Did you guys notice that? Look at this. I, I read over it, but I don't know if we picked up on it. He says here, Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and was, uh, and who is to come. That's God. The one that was from the beginning. Beginning to the end, right? Alpha to, we're going to see the Alpha and the Omega in just a minute in, in verse 8. He says, And from the seven spirits of God who are before his throne. Why seven spirits do you think? You guys ever have anyone ever thought of this? Yeah, what does seven represent? The number of completeness, right? And here he says he's describing the seven spirits that that greet the seven churches in Asia. He says from the from the Seven spirits that are before God. So I believe he's describing something that's a little beyond our... Because, you know, in my thinking, yeah, God's Holy Spirit, he's like his spirit. But when this revelation comes, it unveils a little bit more. It says he, his spirit has, like, a complete set. It's, it's, full, it's, it's like saying, it's kind of a, a cool way of saying it, but it's like his spirit is so complete, it's the full set. It's everything you need in from God's throne. I mean, His Spirit. And so it describes it with that dimension of, not just, I always thought of one Spirit. Just It's just one Spirit. But here he's, he's saying, from the seven Spirits that are before. So I believe he's describing the fullness of the Holy Ghost. That it has this completeness. His, his Spirit is complete. And so he says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Now, Christ was the faithful witness. When it came to, when they said, show us the Father, he said, guys, haven't I been with you guys so long? You've seen me, you've seen the Father. I came to show you the Father. I'm the, I'm the faithful witness. I'm showing you what God wants you to know. And so he says this, he says, I'm, he was, that Christ was the firstborn, not, he's a faithful witness, and the firstborn from the dead. 
He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. And to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Well, I, I, did. I shouldn't have skipped over that part. And to him who what? Loves us and has released us. You know when people say, Jesus loves me, this I know. Or the Bible tells me so, right? You guys learned that? You never learned that, that in Sunday school? Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. We used to do that all the time. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. That's the sign language that Jesus loves me. This is this is something that when they go, how do you know if he loves you? Where does it say that in the Bible? And I've had a lot of people ask me that. They're like, well, I see it says he died for me. But, and I see it says God so loved the world that he gave his son. But it doesn't say Jesus loves me. Like, directly. In those words, and I'm like, yes, it does. The last book of the Bible, like that, the frosting on the cake, I call it. You know, the, the the thing that ends up the whole Bible, in the very intro, to the to the churches. What's the introduction? We get the Father who was, who is, who is to come. We get the seven spirits of God, and we get Jesus, but He gets a little bit of an extra description. He's described as the faithful witness first. He's described as the firstborn from the dead. That's a really good moniker. And he gets described as the ruler of the kings of the earth. And then he gets described as the one who loves us. And has released us from our sins by his blood. Those are really cool monikers for Jesus. That's, this is the unveiling, by the way, of Jesus we get a more spotlight on him. God's been around a long time. we got already lots of details about him, but this is going to focus us on what Christ did. And so he's the one who did all these things. He's the ruler. I think that term is flying all over. This is, this is a challenge to like landing in my Bible. No eating my Bible. <laughs> that hurts. <laughs> he's a, so so he's, he's releasing us from, from sins, guys, by his blood. And here's something else that it says. Verse 6. And he made... And I'm only going to go to verse 8 tonight. But he made us, it says, to be a kingdom. Priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then he says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him. And even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. The second amen in the first chapter. By the way, amen just means so be it. Like, you know, when, when someone at the end of the prayer says, anyone give an amen? They're asking a prayer request of God. And, and you say amen, what you're saying is, so be it. May, may it be so. Like what, what, what you just prayed, God make it so. That's what you're, you're literally proclaiming. And so he said, and then in verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who, wa who is, who was, and who, who is to come, the Almighty. This is God declaring who He is. Now, I know a lot of guys, they'll say, um, wait, this is, um, this is Jesus. Well, no, just hang on, there's going to be more about Jesus. But God's declaring He's the Alpha. And, now, this is interesting. This is God declaring it. Who did God show himself to first? The Gentiles? No, to the Jews, remember? Remember in the burning bush, Moses, he says, uh, who do I say sent me? And, they, and, they, and they, the Lord says, you tell them, I am that I am sent you. That's who I am, I'm, I'm God. And they're like, how much more explanation do you need? I'm, I exist, I'm him. I've existed forever. I am that I am has sent you. Now later when Jesus is on the earth, they're gonna they're gonna ask him you know a question and he's gonna answer them with two words I am and the Jews are gonna pick up stones to stone Jesus because they say you're a man and you proclaim yourself to be God you're saying you're equal to God he's going um, doesn't it say we're written you know behold I call you all sons of God he answers them gives them the gives them the the uh, answer and they just like don't know what to do he he was God in the flesh. And so, here, but here we have an introduction to God saying, 
on the Alpha and the Omega, which is really interesting because if you're a student of Scripture, you go, well, wait a minute. If this is the God of the Old Testament, he would be saying, this is Greek. You guys, I don't know if you understand this, but Alpha and Omega is the Greek letters. It's the first letter of the Greek alphabet and the last letter. Alpha, Omega, beginning and end. What's the first letter in Hebrew? Do you guys know the Hebrew alphabet? Aleph and Tov. So, if he was going to say, if he would have said right here, I am the Aleph and the Tov, (laughs) <laughs> then we would go, oh, this book is written to Jews. Because you would use a Jewish expression for beginning and end. There's another Jewish idiom that they use for the first and the last that they could have, he could have used here. But he didn't do that. He used, he used the, the expression that is a Greek expression. And I know that might not seem like a big deal to you guys, but listen... Him using this Greek expression on the Alpha and the Omega has a big significance for us, okay? Yeah, I know. The termites are crazy right now. Sorry, Oreo. Oh, yeah. They're like going nuts. Well, I'm almost done. Okay, so... So he's, he's declaring this book to be written to which audience? Jewish or Gentile? Both. And, well, yeah, but this one emphasizes to the churches at Asia... Okay, which yes. isn't the Jewish province, and it uses Greek idiom, so it's not saying... And by the way, who's... Okay, the guy penning it, is he a Jew or a Gentile? Do you guys know this? John the Apostle? Yeah, he's a Jew. He's a Jew. Okay, so if anyone would know to pick a Jewish idiom right here, it would have been him. But he, God did not have him pen that. And I don't think that's by accident. I think that's so that we feel included. Okay, now don't worry, in this book there's plenty of stuff addressed to the Jews. But this portion of the book is addressed to us as Gentiles. And I want you to, to key in on that because when we go through the seven letters to the seven churches, there's seven churches in Asia Minor. They're not seven churches in, in Israel. Okay, they're not one up in the, by the tribe of Dan, one over by Benjamin, you know, one down by Judah. And it's not the seven of the twelve tribes of Israel he's writing to. He's writing to seven churches. Okay? Now, seven being that complete number. Again, this is going to be a really cool study for you guys. It's so fun to learn what's the messages to the seven churches. Because once you learn there's different messages for each church, you can find out it has some really great spiritual encouragement for wherever you're at in your walk. When you read all seven letters, you'll find that during your lifetime you'll probably pass through a couple of the circumstances that are in each of those churches. And those letters will become even more personally encouraging to you as you, as you study these seven letters. So we're going to break down each letter to each church over the upcoming weeks. I'll do, you know, each letter broke down, what's the main point, what, what's he emphasizing. But we won't get to that. Next week we're going to go into the intro to those letters. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.